Hello, can everyone, can anyone hear me? <laughs> Should be in the stream now. I think so, yep. Hopefully, I think we've got some, yep, we've got some viewers watching. I'm just gonna wait a few minutes uh, before we start. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Quarantine Bunker Studio. I am your man out of Japan, Jay Contra, and today we are going to be streaming Rendering Ranger R2, one of the more infamous uh, Super Famicom games that only ever came out in Japan. It's got a weird, crazy story behind it. It was a game developed in Germany by a studio that had developed, like they were developing Commodore 64 games up until like... 1990 and like remember the Co the Commodore 64 when did it come out like 60 like 82 like it was crazy like the studio was just it was like pumping out these side scrolling games i think they came out with i think Super Turrican for the NES came out in like was it like 1990 also like a very very strange situation where you had this guy you had Manfred Trends who he did both the programming and the music for this game. Actually, let's see if we can get the um get some music going. Now we at least can and then we can test the audio levels. Please let me know uh if you're having a, a difficulty hearing my voice over actually yeah, maybe I'll turn the, the desktop audio down a little bit. There we go. Maybe even more. I, mean, I think I remember you have to turn the you have to turn the audio down quite low in order for people to actually hear what I'm saying. How high do your how high do your streamers keep their audio? Is the audio like really low in their streams? Yeah. 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 All right, let me turn that down even more then. Get some nice back. Get some just. Yeah, and then I'll turn it down here too. I mean, I pro if this was a proper setup, I would have, uh, I'd have ear headphones on. There we go. Okay. So welcome everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we'll start the stream up in a few minutes uh, once people are actually in here and watching. I know it's a very strange time considering it's a Monday. Uh, it's Monday evening here uh, in Europe. However, elsewhere, I know in the US, it's still like the middle of the day. So I don't know if a Monday stream uh, is gonna get a lot of people in it uh, as opposed to the Saturday or Sunday stream, but just trying to work out, maybe getting a rhythm with this. Now, Rendering Ranger, if you've ever, if you've been like me, you walk into a a used Japanese uh, video game store, and you see this, like, dink, this thing with, like, a dinky package. It's like there was barely any design or thought put into it. And you see the price tag, and it's, like, 250,000 yen. It could be upwards of 300,000 yen. Uh, depending on the store and the condition you actually find the game in. And you're like, why? Just wh Why is this so expensive? Like, first of all, wh why is this game so expensive? And two, what even is this game? Because Render Ranger R2, people don't really even talk about it because it's um, pretty obscure, although I've seen reviews on, like, SNES Drunk and other couple places. So, really, what we're going to try and do today is we're actually just going to, we're just going to play the game and we're going to see, and, and something I want to pose as a question to everyone uh, who watches this is, would you, buy, would you pay uh, $3,000 for this video game? Although I remember, you know, years ago, I know I th the, pri the skyrocketing price on this has been crazy. Because I think maybe five or six years ago, before the SNES really took off, uh, you could find this for I think like 500 bucks was I think the going rate for this a couple years ago and even then like who's, who's gonna be pay, who's gonna pay $500 for this well, let's just get it started yeah we've been been streaming for about five minutes now I wonder if what the world record is for rendering ranger I wonder could we could we have the world record in this stream? Is that possible? Should I get a timer? Because who is going to have even attempted the world record? I actually, do you know, I hold the number six world record for uh, 
Japanese Castlevania easy mode. Only by virtue of only five other people had tried to have it listed. <laughs> Well, then I guess I could have the number two world record, but if I can complete this in the stream. Yeah. Should I submit it? <laughs> now, the first level, the thing about Render Ranger R2 is that it really tricks you. Because you're probably picking this up, you might have seen an Infamitsu. Like, you th like think about it, you got to transport yourself back to 1995 when this game first came out. And you're like, okay, here's this rando game coming out, like, when, you've, I think, like, on the same day. It was, like, a Friday, I think. So, it's, like, you've got, I think, like, 20, like, legit 20 other games coming out. You've got, like, seven other games coming out for the um, Super Famicom. You've got, like, five games for the PlayStation and then another five games for the Sega Saturn coming out at the same time. And among the seven games that came out for the Super Famicom, you've got to be thinking, like, Okay, I'll just give this a shot. I saw the review in Famitsu. It was got like a 20 out of 40. And then you boot it up and it's like, "Oh, okay, it's Contra." Like All right, cuz this like this would really trick you. If this if this was the first level, you have no idea what this game has in store with you. You're for you. You're just like, "Oh, okay, it's just Contra. Fine." <laughs> And then, like, what, like, what even is this? Is this supposed to be Garfield? Is this like, I'm sorry, John. I don't know. Looks like Garfield to me. Well, see, I haven't. The, the problem is with this game is that I get to level seven, and I can't, I can't get past level seven because there's just so many enemies on the screen at once. Uh, I just, I'm getting old. Like, maybe if I was a kid and you know, this was the only game that I had and I could just play the one the, the same thing over and over again, but that's just not me. Can I? I want to switch. Yeah, we'll do it now. The spread gun. Oh, shoot. Come on. It's much easier if you have the spread gun, I promise. <laughs> much like Contra, this game gets a lot easier once you have the spread gun properly. Because you start out with just the one beam, you start out with like the two bullets. But then you can very quickly get this massive V-shaped spread that is just absolutely unstoppable. So this is the time. Hello, Danny. How are you doing? 80s retro gamer. Where are you? Well, hold. On. Okay, yeah. If the sound, oh, let me. All right, let me turn up the sound a little bit. I don't want to overwhelm. Let me know. Let me know if the sound levels all right. Danny, yes, absolutely. I do own Rendering Ranger R2. I would never, I would never go <laughs> to a website and download the ROM file. Never. Not for a game that costs uh, $2,500. And uh, uh, I, I would only play for like three hours before getting bored of it and putting it on a shelf. I would never download the ROM. I would not, and I would not suggest that you do that either. 80s Retro Gamer, what's going on? Where are you at? Where's everybody, like, I'm trying to get a better idea of where all of the, uh, of all the subscribers are from, because I know where the, where the audience is from, from the people who are watching videos in the stream, and it seems to be, it's mostly, like, America. Um, America's, like, 75%. Still no game sound? Hold on, let me, all right, let me keep pumping this up. We'll keep pumping this up until we get... Now, hold on. Let's try 15%. Okay, how's that? Let me know. <laughs> That's... 
Yeah, let's go back with the spread gun. So the spread gun is very good because you eventually, you get the spread eventually. What I also like about the game is that the power-ups are actually distinct with the gun. So that, what, what I mean is that, so it's like got discrete power-ups. What, what do I mean by discrete power-ups? It's got red orbs, green orbs, blue orbs, and red and green and then like orange orbs because there's the, you only get two shots in the first level it's very strange yeah so here's the laser it's got one power up oh yeah and then i haven't even done the shot yet yeah that's it nope ah shoot and then the trick here with this with this middle is this the middle boss no this is the final boss i think of the level Still no game sound? All right, hold on. Let's, jeez. Put up the 50? All right, I'm just gonna put it up. This is the, this is the normal audio that I even just record the, um, when I do, uh, when I do video capture, this is the audio. I mean, it's showing up in OBS. You can hear it? Okay, I don't want it to be terrible. And I've only got one life, although it's only the first level, so we can quickly get back here once we get the technical issues smoothed over. I mean, I can pump it up. I can put it on to zero. good i'll i'll bump it up a little and just tell me if it's annoying all right okay at least people can can hear us <laughs> danny you're gonna call the fbi on me <laughs> wouldn't that you know that's the craziest thing that would be absolutely phenomenal to me is if someone ever got like swatted because they were they were emulating something <laughs> What's no speak of? Oh, the like a song? Yeah. Like that's the that's the crazy thing. Like you know, I was I just had this thought the other day. Well, like that's a, that's the a thing that we like we that's just the historical memory that we have in our society today, is that it wasn't, but it was like literally just ten years ago that people were getting raided by the FBI because they were downloading MP3s. Whereas like today, you just go on to, you just go on to YouTube and you either just stream it, you go on a Spotify and you stream it, or you go on a YouTube and you just download the MP3 directly. And nobody cares about that stuff anymore. But 10 years ago, people were being brought to civil court. They were being fined millions of dollars because they downloaded like two songs on Napster. Uh, 80s Retro Gamer, this is Rendering Ranger R2. This is one of the, I don't know, I read an article um, the other day that was saying it's not actually rare. And I don't know about that. I think relative to other uh, Super Famicom games, it actually is rare. Hold on, I just gotta get a picture of the password. And it's sort of like that thing where it's like, oh, Earthbound isn't actually rare, but it's like, if it's hard to find and it's expensive, well, that that, sound, that makes it sound like it's rare to me. Danny says, can't wait for my PC Engine games to come from Japan. Yeah, you know, the PC Engine, I really got the bite for the PC Engine just as I was leaving Japan. And so I bought a few games. Uh, unfortunately, they're all in America right now. Uh, so I do not, I actually have my, I have a Duo R here, um, but I only have a couple games with me. Uh, what do I have? I've got, oh, it's like P94, P48, I can't remember, it's a World War II shooter. Um, there's another one, what else do I have? Um, oh, I've got, oh, I think I've got Alzadik with me, I've got, 
uh, Psychic Storm. Psychic Storm, which apparently, like, no one's ever heard about. It doesn't have a wiki page. There's no review of it on... On, uh... On YouTube. That's something that I'd like to play. I played it a little bit, and I thought it was pretty good. My password. You get us to level two. Is that zero? No, that's O. I like... I do like that they have the distinction. If you, if you look very closely... Between the zero and the O, the zero has a line through it. Like the Danish O, as I like to call it. <laughs> there we are. We're going to level two. It is Retro Gamer is saying, I'm playing a master, the master game, master, si master system, excuse me. Yeah, you know, the Master System is, like, it's completely off my radar. George absolutely loves it. Uh, although, well, she loves the Genesis. Um, wait, how did you get your Master System? Oh, she's gonna go, she's going up to get it right now. <laughs> No, it's not a cheat code, it's just a password, because that's how you actually, like, get through this game, is with passwords. I'm, uh, see, I, I feel it's not a cheat code, because I've unlocked it. If it's a cheat code, that's something that, like, you know, you can just input. And that does, like, you know, in, you know infinite, like, in invincibility or infinite ammo. I feel like these passwords are unlocks. You do yeah, I would, you know, I send them, um, I'll look up your, I'll look at the channel, because I've never, I've never, I don't know anything about the Master System. Well, and yeah, so George just brought me her Master System here. Hold on, am I, am I showing it? Yeah, here it is. Yeah, this is, wait, didn't you get this for like a piece of bread? Yeah, I traded it also. Bread. Yeah, this was back when the Master System was still... I think the Genesis and the Master System were still kind of under the radar. So George just went to like, she it's was... like five years ago, it's not that long ago. Well, and like, I think... came with controller and leads and everything. Yeah, well, and I think in Europe, there's like way more of these, because in Japan, like, it just didn't take off that much. It came we're... with a game as well, but... Uh, yeah, was it... It wasn't Sonic, was it? Because there was a Master System Sonic. It's like Jungle Force. Do you have any other games for that, or is it just no, that? Just that's also the Mark II. Sega was really into making lots of different versions of their systems. <laughs> but that was also, a th I mean, it's still a thing sort of today, I suppose. Now, now that I think about it. Because <laughs> in, in America, I mean, in Japan, a Master System is like $200, even just loose. I gotta pay the- I'm getting the stream jitters. I actually got okay at, uh... At Rendering Ranger R2, um... Because I'm gonna do a review of it. Like, I, like, I'm not quite a review, and it's not quite a retrospective. I don't even know what to call it. Shoot, I'm getting, like, obliterated. There we go. See, this is the proper spread gun. Bruce, yeah, I haven't... Uh, man, I can't believe you're here, dude. <laughs> I Because I haven't streamed... I mean, it's been years. At least a year, if not a year and a half. Uh, since, I, since I've done a proper stream. I think the last stream I did... I mean, when was that would have been one of those uh, Famicom streams that I did years ago. And Spruce was there. Spruce remembers. <laughs> desert speedrun? It's not Desert Bus? Shoot, I'm not gonna get the I'm not gonna get the blue power up. And the blue, like that laser, like is so good. It's like look at that. And especially with the um with the guy that's coming up, the blue laser is absolutely deadly. And then yeah, let's not even wait. I think because when you blow it up, 
It doesn't even give you anything when you blow it up. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, see, you blow it up and it's just like, oh. Or you could just walk right past it. Oh, shoot. Yeah, of course I would have missed the, uh... Missed the giant door. See, Danny's asking, if I were to speculate which Japanese console games could spike in price in the next 6 to 12 months, um... I would say most likely it's going to be the GameCube. Because I think... The GameCube is really underappreciated in Japan, whereas in America it seems to really be taking off right now. And so I will bet you anything, once Japan starts letting tourists back into the country, you're going to have a lot of tourists who have that GameCube nostalgia who are probably seeing like, why would I buy Super Mario Sunshine for $100 in America when I could buy a Japanese version for like 30 because right now, the GameCube is, is right now in Japan, like, you can still go out and buy a GameCube for $30. You can, um, all of the big, like, Nintendo games are still, like, super cheap. Like, the only, there's only a couple of very expensive GameCube games. Oh, nice. So, Spruce is saying he RGB modded his AV Famicom and SNES Jr. Did you do that yourself, Spruce? Because that's something that I've, like, always thought that maybe I could do. But I've just never gotten around to it. And I'm not sure um, if I even want to do it. If I want that clear of a picture. <laughs> come on, come on. So, you know what? This really reminds me of the... The... F the climax of, uh, what was it? Not Space Rangers, not Space Odyssey, Galaxy Quest. That's what this reminds me of, where they have to, like, walk through all of the blades and time everything. <laughs> that's, that is, I feel, as the same as walking through all of these lasers. It's like, why did this, why did they put lasers everywhere? It doesn't make any sense. Okay, I gotta time this. Oh, of course. So then you gotta be careful with this because you've gotta time that one. And then you've gotta time that other, you've gotta time these. The sequence is just baffling to me. Oh, okay, all right. And then we just gotta wait for this. <laughs> 80s Retro Gamer is saying, please don't play Desert Putts. <laughs> I had no intention. <laughs> and then Spruce is saying, no, he had someone uh, do the... How much did it cost, Spruce, to have your um, Famicom RGB modded? Because, you know, I don't... The Famicom doing an RGB mod of it... Well, I think because, uh, you know, you've got to pay for the expertise and the board itself is, like, more expensive than you would expect, right? Because it's like, you, you have to buy, like, a, a circuit board of that, right? Welcome, Kiel. Hello. I, oh, I hope I'm saying your, your, uh, your name correctly. Thanks, Kiel. Yeah, um, uh, welcome. Where, where are you, um, where are you coming in from, Kiel? Sounds very uh, Scandinav Scandinavian, Scandinavian. <laughs> no, uh, what was it? Sweden? That's a place, right? Norwegia, yeah. <laughs> Swedelandia. I suppose Rendering Ranger would would appeal to European viewers, considering that it was a European developed game. But released only in Japan. It's got a it's got a really weird history to it. Let's see, Spruce is saying it's it's about thirty dollars. So that so the NES RGB board is eighty bucks. The SNES is thirty. Yeah, because the NES, 
I'm assuming does not have native RGB, but the Super Famicom slash SNES does because it had actually the um, it has um, native SCART cables, like it just natively outputs RGB. You've just got to um, use the right cords, right? Yeah, so now we're on the, the third level. So we just went from two levels that were just like Contra run and guns. To now we're on the third level and we are on a horizontally scrolling shooter. And then yeah, look like just look at the look at the absolute firepower you have when you're using the spread shot. I think what I most like about Rendering Ranger R2 is that it does not have the arcadey jank that is just trying to kill you at all times so that it can suck up your quarters. And so that's why it's nice to, be, to play a shooter that has, you know, shields and you've got like five hits, six hits, no, five hits before you die. You've got all these cool power-ups. It is really like a phenomenal game. It's just a shame that it, if you wanted a complete copy, it's like three thousand dollars for a mint copy. Yes, yeah, Bruce is saying that the, as I suspected, this the the Famicom only has composite and RF out. Well, I gotta concentrate. My only real issue with the gameplay of Rendering Ranger is the collision detection. And I think it has to do with how they ended up um, rendering most of the enemies to the point where it's really difficult to tell your hitbox. So like half the time I'm just taking damage from running into terrain and I don't understand why because I don't feel like I'm hitting the terrain, but the game is saying that I am. Now, you could blame yourself for that, but that doesn't that's not a, that's not what I would, that's not what I would do. That doesn't sound like me. And then you've got this shot. I don't even know what to call this this shot right here. Yeah, so let's see, 80s Retro Gamer saying, am I in the UK now? Yes, uh, been been here for uh, the last three months, moved here at the beginning of May. Oh, come on, where's the, yeah, come on, give me the spread, give me the spread. Now, I will be very interested if we can make it past my give up point of level seven on the street. Because for one, I don't play as well when I'm streaming. And for two, maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll just practice it enough to the point where I can get past the, the kaleidoscope of enemies that this game throws at you. Although, actually, no, the boss of this is really annoying. It gets into full force about what I was talking about, the collision detection in this game. Because the boss has this weird movement pattern that... gets, gets in very close to you, and it's very hard to tell how you cannot hit him. What I mean, what I mean to say is that it's very easy to hit the boss and take damage that way, because the boss's shots on this level aren't really anything to worry about. It's actually just running into the boss. That's the problem.
And I'd say the main strategy for most of these bosses is just to wait for your bomb to kick in. Because your bomb actually regenerates over time. And your bomb just does, like, so much more damage than your shot does. Or is that later? I, yeah, I think that boss, the, the really tough boss, is maybe not for this level. There we go. One life to spare. Let's see, let me see. Hold on. And then, but then also, man, this yeah, the game's really tricky because it'll have like two or three bosses in the middle of the stage, so you're never really sure, you know, until you've actually played your way through when the level's actually gonna end. I think I'll catch up. Sorry if I'm not reading your comments. Uh, this is a really tough part. <laughs> The walking parts are actually a nice little punctuation uh, to this. And so once I die, yeah, which is now, I'll be able to catch up with the chat. Let's see, Danny's saying, I'm surprised they didn't reprint Rendering Ranger like they did with Demon King and Iron Commando. I think it's because no one knows who owns the rights to this. I was doing a little investigation for the... Uh, for a video that I want to make. And I think the, the thing with Rendering Ranger R2 is the the developer ended up being a part of THQ um, in the late 90s, and then THQ um, pooped it, you know, in the 2010s or whenever. And so I doubt anybody knows who owns um, the, the legal rights to this. Because the publisher was Virgin Interactive, who I think is a part of... Oh, who, who are they a part of now? They're a part of some other conglomerate. And so I would suspect that the publisher doesn't know who owns this, and the developer... Like, like, man, like maybe you'd have to ask like Manfred Trends, <laughs> who actually owns it. Unless he actually owns it, which I don't even know if he does, because it would be the company he worked for that owns it. And so I think it's because of that, it's very, it'd be almost impossible. Um, and then you'd also have to have the financial will um, to have cartridges of this reprinted. I think it'd be really cool if it was, because it's a little, like, uh, time piece that people just don't remember. Uh, let's see, Spruce is saying, don't I play on a PVM? Yeah, I used to in Japan, but now that I'm in the UK, um, I had to get rid of the PVM. I almost paid to have it shipped here. Um, it would just been a, have been a pain to like get the electrical um, worked out because it's on a different voltage. Uh, let's see. Let's see. And then Spruce is also asking, did I ever get another AV Famicom? Yeah, I ended up, once my, my first AV Famicom, the PPU um, blew up. So I had to get another AV Famicom. So I've got that, but it's back in America. Yeah, it's a top loader, so if you're not familiar with what the AB... Oh, yeah? Okay. Um, no, because I don't have any of my cartridges with me. Well, I have, I have some of my... <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess we do have an AB Famicom here. <laughs> yeah, type in chat if you want to see uh, George's AB Famicom. Uh, let's see. Ranger and Ranger. Nice guns. <laughs> Let's see, Dazrael is saying, I find it crazy that the best Turkin game is Gunlord, which wasn't even made by anyone from Factor 5 or Rainbow Arts. Gunlord, you're gonna have to tell me about Gunlord, because I've, I've never actually heard about that. And then 80s retro gamers saying, Virgin was Apple? No, I don't, wait, <laughs> what? No, Virgin, I don't think Virgin had anything to do with Apple, as far as I remember. I'm, I think Virgin Interactive, oh, it's like Vivendi, I think, owns it? Hold on, let me check my notes. I've got this. I've got this down in my notes somewhere. Yeah. So Virgin Interactive got bought out by. No, that's Rainbow Arts. Yeah, they might be owned by Interplay now. That's the. That's who might own Virgin Interactive right now. You want the Famicom? Okay. <laughs> All right, George is going to get the um, 
the Famicom while I look up how to input this, uh, this code, the password, the unlock, not the cheat code. Like, I don't know, you'd have to be a real baller to actually be able to play through the whole game without using the password. VP. P. O. M. Okay, oh, she's actually got it in a box here. Hold on, let me just make sure the, uh... Yeah, so here is the, um... Here's the top-loading uh, AV Famicom. So the thing that's unique about the Japanese AV top loader is that in Japan, the Famicom, when it was originally released, only output, uh, it only output RF, which obviously was not really working well with the more modern TVs that were coming out in the later 80s and early 90s. Also, the original Famicom had its controllers hardwired to the console. So what was very unique when they actually ended up releasing the AV Famicom was you had control you had controller ports so you could actually detach your controller and you had the um, composite right yeah composite out um, which actually it only output mono audio anyways. The Famicom does not have stereo audio as far as I remember. Yeah, it had the um, the microphone. The original AV Famicom had microphone, a microphone in the second controller, which is actually um, key in the original Le Legend of Zelda. You had to, um, there was one of the enemies like impossible to kill unless you blow into the microphone. Yeah, the rabbits. And so that's in the English manual. It says you have to like, you have to like, yeah, they don't like sound, but the NES did not have microphones with it, so it like baffled some people. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then let's see, Kiel is saying, um, are we only playing this today or playing other titles? No, I think I wanna, I mean, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I think I'm only gonna be playing uh, Rendering Ranger R2 and probably try and play it for a couple hours. Um, and especially see if I can get past uh, level 7, which is the place. I've, I've played this for like, I think, 5 hours at this point, and I still have not been able to get past level 7. Uh, other games that I've been playing um, that, will, that I think I'll put in another stream are uh, Magical Poppin'. Uh, another, I'm, I'm trying to weirdly focus on really expensive games that people don't know, know a lot about and like trying to figure out why they might be so expensive. <laughs> And then I think, depending on if the streaming actually takes off or not, I've just got this crazy idea where I want to play every Super Famicom game released in order. Oh yeah, and then I've got to switch. I did find a guy who was trying to play every PlayStation game ever released. Uh, well, there's a guy on YouTube called Dr. Sparkle who is trying to do like video reviews of every Famicom, of every like Nintendo game ever released in order. And he's like doing, he does them in bulk. So he'll have like one review, which is like, you know, January to March of 1985. Oh uh, yeah, like Cron Tendo, uh, maybe, maybe you've heard of it ever heard of it. <laughs> I mean, if I end up streaming, like, even, like, two or three times a week, like, you could, uh, let's see, the SNES has, like, what, 1,500 games for it? So you could do that in, like, two years. You know, you, you take a, at one day, you, you do, you used to practice the game, the other um, day you actually used to play the game itself. Yeah, I don't see. So George and I have, I think, a very big uh, philosophical disagreement, where I don't feel like you need to finish a game, whereas George feels like you need to finish a game. And so, she, and she will play like, like, weren't you playing like a visual novel for like 80 hours, just to get all of the ending? 
And it's like, I just do not have the patience for that. The only games that I have the patience for that are Total War. <laughs> That's like true. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll play I'll play Shogun 2 for like 50 hours just to do a no um, auto resolve victory, and then I'll go straight into Warhammer 2 to do a no auto resolve victory. But then I'll be like, uh, man, Lance is too hard in Heart Gold. I'm not doing this. <laughs> yeah. Well, because so, yeah, I'm talking. I don't have to go to Kanto, especially because I just played um, Fire Red. So I don't need to go back to, you know, Gen 1. Is it though? Let's see, a uh, video game is asking, when am I going to get a haircut? <laughs> I don't know. I Yeah, when Corona ends, I will get a haircut. Although I have been considering, and I'm now getting even closer to just getting some hair clippers and having, and having George just shear it all off um, so that I can, one... Uh, confront my fear of baldness and two also yeah like I, I'm not going to the, the hair cuttery one because of corona but two also because I don't want to spend like $40 on a haircut yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the thing is that really like the people on the stream this is the most people have ever seen me at one concurrent time. <laughs> Cause all, yeah, I mean, all my friends are either in America or Japan. We might, mm, this, this is gonna get dicey. We might have to use save states on this. Although of course I am playing this with the original game on original hardware. So I'm, I mean, I mean magic, that's, that's what we're gonna have to use. My biggest collection. Hold on. Yeah, I'll catch up with the comments in a bit. Sorry if I can't uh, respond immediately, but that's that's the thing is I would love to be doing more like vertical or horizontally scrolling shooters, but you can't have a lot of interaction in those kinds of games. Because how do your like how do your um speedrunning friends interact? Yes, I call George watches a lot of speedrunners, and so I just call them all. Well, that's the thing. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, see, this is, this is just an obvious, like, tracking pattern. The problem with this guy is that he gets up close, and then he starts, like, twirling around. And it's really tough to determine where your hitbox begins and his, like... See, he like rotates around. I think if you go here. Yeah, see, he just, he like, he just starts twirling and he keeps going so fast. All right, so now we've hit a real robot block. Um, let me. I gotta put in that password again, and then we will use magic to um, prevent us from getting stuck in this quandary again. But let me read the track tra uh, chat real quick. Eighties retro gamer is saying it's no wonder I have arthritis in my wrists. I blame computer games. You know, I'm surprised I haven't like had carpal tunnel or. or... <laughs> yeah, that's. A... 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, the body is frail. You're you're just gonna end up. It's just it's just constantly deteriorating yeah, past. Right. Yeah, you're gonna get arthritis no matter what you do. That's just the human condition. Let's see. Yeah, and then uh, re uh, 80s Retro Gamer also says it's always the side scrolling shooters that are expensive. Yes, usually. Although, when you think about, like, especially for the, the Super Famicom, they're actually. Compared to a lot of other games. Um, when you think about side-scrolling shooters, the expensive ones are really like Rendering Ranger R2, Biometal, and a couple of other ones, but they are... Yeah, but that, well, that's for Sega Saturn. I'm talking about the Super Famicom specifically. I'd say in general, yes, but they tend to top out at around 200 bucks. Like, you see it for the Dreamcast, Saturn, PS1, with, with a few exceptions, they tend to top out at a certain level, whereas you have a whole slew of other games... Like, especially for the SNES, like, it's a lot of the action platformers, like Hagane um, in America, like Mega Man, the X Mega Man games. Oh, they get, like, super, super expensive. I would say so, too, but it seems like shooters, for the most part, have the. They have the monopoly on. Like, 99% of shooters are, like, above 50 bucks, at least, if not 100. Whereas it's a, it's a very it's a very uncommon shooter that's, like, below 50 bucks. Like, say, Axelay, or... Um, there's a, um, there's actually a bunch for the Super Famicom that are pretty cheap, yeah. Um, moving on, let's see. Let's see, Kiel is saying, but this... But Rendering Ranger R2 is rare. I mean, it only came out in rather limited quality quantity is so it's expensive because of that yeah you know the story about uh retro uh, sorry retro <laughs> render rendering ranger r2 is that it was developed by a german studio and they for some reason because it's like you know 94 95 the playstation and sega saturn are out the snes is starting to get long in the tooth and so it was probably hard to find a publishing company that was going to put out a cartridge game in 95. And because especially like when you look at the era it's coming out, like that's, it's like November 95. So it's just as the SNES has reached its peak, you've got um, uh, Yoshi's Island coming out. You've got um, Diddy's Conquest, uh, Donkey Kong Country 2 coming out at the same time. That it just didn't, I think, make financial sense to have like a, a run and gun horizontal uh, scrolling shooter hybrid to come out. It's to the point where you had a German studio that could only find a distributor. It was a European distributor. It's very strange, like the story behind it, because you've got a company that is based in Europe. You've got Virgin Interactive Media, who a lot of their bread and butter is distributing Japanese game th games. They actually distributed a lot of like Capcom games um, in Europe. Somehow, then they did the reverse where they were distributing a European game in Japan. And so, yeah, it's, it's really sought after because, for one, it's really good. And two, yes, it was printed in such low quantities that it's one of those games that you really have to find in order to complete a set. Alright, now I need to use some magic real quick. Hold on a second. <laughs> my biggest collection, yeah, so my my biggest collection, well, it's, I mean, it's gotta be the N64. That's the one collection that I've actually completed. And so that's gotta be like 400 games. And I don't think my, like I've got a lot of Famicom games, not quite as many Super Famicom. Yeah, I would say it's probably the N64, and it's actually, like, I've probably played about 50 of them, <laughs> now that I think about it. Uh, what happened? Oh, nothing happened. I, you know, I just felt the same emptiness that I've always felt. Oh, yeah, well, I think that happened, like, long before I even finished, um... 
long before I finished my N64 collection, I was just like, the N64 sucks, there's like 20 good games for it. Which is by and large how I still feel. I'm not as angry as I was before at it. But I do wish that I had collected SNES games, like, when I had hit Japan, rather than N64. For one, because I would have ended up saving a lot more money. <laughs> Because when I got to Japan in, like, 2012, the SNES was still really highly collectible. It was still fairly cheap to get a lot of these games. And then once I finally realized that the SNES is the superior console, uh, it was too late. <laughs> but I still think the SNES is still very affordable. Uh, in terms of in terms of Super, Super Famicom games. Because you can complete... You can get a good, like, Nintendo SNES library for, like, 100 bucks. You could, like... It's insane the games you could buy. Because you can buy, like, Yoshi's Island's, like, $10 for a cartridge. Like, um... Super Mario World's $10. Uh, most of the, the final fights are, like, less than $10. Um, that's actually a series of videos I want to do. I was watching, um, there's a uh, YouTuber that I have started to get on, um, Nintendo Collector, Nintendo Collect, I forgot what his name is. Uh, but he does these, like, $100 guides to systems, and I really, really, I really want to do that just for the Japanese versions of the systems. Because you could save a lot of money that way. I mean, how much is um, Link to the Past? Like $10 for a cartridge? Mario Kart, $10? In Japanese. Because, I mean, in American, Link to the Past is like 60 bucks. Oh, I ran out of bombs. Oh, shoot. That's the trick is, I think, my problem with shooters, although not so much, I think I'm starting to get over it, is that I really tend to hoard my bombs to the point where often it's very much the bomb that saves you from dying. And so if you're hoarding your bombs, you're really, like, losing out on, like, three or four lives, depending on how you look at it. And what I really like about Rendering Ranger is that you actually, um, and you, your bombs uh, recuperate over time as opposed to other scrolling shooters where you've got to, like, collect them as you're going on. Danny's saying, it's pro playing every PS1 game ever in release is probably a nightmare. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that's why the guy I found... Oh, it's got to be a few thousand. I mean, the Super Famicom had 1,500 games, I think, the SNES in total. Was it 3,000? I think if you, if, you can, if you count every version, it might be 3,000. But if you're talking about unique titles... I would probably say it's got to be 1,500 games, probably. For the PS1, yeah, it's got to be a few thousand, at least. Because it really um, lowered the barrier of entry for development studios to get into the game. In terms of uh, manufacturing cost. And rights issues as well. I just I love the um, these enemy designs. It's just like it's it's impossible to tell what's going on with all of those grates. Oh, I gotta switch. And then my I think the only other significant problem is I have two real problems uh, with rendering Ranger R2. One is the the hitbox. Um, as opposed to the enemy uh, render sprites. And then the other is I'm just not good enough to be able to switch my shots on the fly. Your collection? Your Vita collection? Uh, what, what would you... So George wants to talk about her Vita collection. <laughs> you want me to talk about it? Uh, you know, the Vita, I think, is great because it has the cartridges, which is big for me. Because, like the, like, the PSP is a catastrophe of a system. Because it has those, like, tiny discs. The UMDs. Do you still have um, National Treasure, the UMD, that you bought in Hong Kong? You gave it away? George, let's remember these. <laughs> Food for dogs. Uh, shout out to Food for Dogs. 
Yeah, much more famous than we are. <laughs> Doesn't she have her boyfriend? Um, what, what what's his name? <laughs> Was he also a part of her dog food enterprise? So yeah, this is the part I'm talking about where he like flips around 20 times, and you can't tell. You like try to get into his crotch, but you're not sure at what point his crotch begins and your hitbox begins. I think, ooh, this is gonna be dicey. This is gonna be close. Yeah, it depends on if he goes into... Oh, shh. Okay, this is, ooh, this is gonna be dicey. I might be able to do it if I can get my bombs back, if I can regenerate my bombs by the time he ends up coming back. So I've just got to dodge his um, his homing laser spheres. That shouldn't be an issue. But it's just, will I have the bombs by the time that he ends up lowering on the field? That's going to be the real make or break of this boss fight. If I get the two bombs, yeah, it's possible. It's possible if I can. Oh, there's seem. Oh, there's actually a frame where you can actually hit him. Okay, where's he coming? Where's he coming? Come on. Yeah. Okay. All right. That was. That was too close. Yeah, and then I'll read chat in a second. Um, well, I mean, I might as well just uh, play through their level really quickly until I die, because I'll die. <laughs> I'll die in like two seconds. Although, is this one of those levels? No, I think. Yeah, no, you just end up and you land. This next level is like absolutely ridiculous, absolutely crazy. This next level. Yeah, let's get inside, and then we'll see how far I can get before I get iced. Oh, no, actually, they um, restore your health. They don't give you any more lives, but at least they restore your health. But I can't, like, there's no way I'm getting through this whole level on one life. It's just, yeah, see, like that. Of course, I always forgot about that part where you just have the doors that come down and automatically kill you in one hit. All right, let me, uh, I gotta take a picture of the password. Like, remember, remember back when you actually had to write down passwords? All right, let me just, uh, I'll read through the, let me read through the chat real quick. See, um, Desriel saying he resorted to buying hair clippers. The first ever set never arrived, so he had to buy another pair. They both ended up arriving. So now, <laughs> what are you gonna do with two hair clippers? <laughs> I need to borrow your sister's hair clippers because I don't think the ones that I have. Okay, well, <laughs> I mean, I guess we could use my hair clippers, but I don't think they're not meant for head hair. I don't know if they would get like choked up or something. Let's see, Danny's saying there are quite a bit of shooters on PC Engine that are over $200. Um, I think there are a lot of good shooters that are below $200, but yeah, there's like crazy expensive ones. I mean, of course there's Sapphire, which is like 700. Like I think it's like even, even today now, it's like worth like $900. Let's see. 80s retro gamers saying it also depends how late the game was released in the life cycle of the console. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why like Little Samson is as expensive as it is. I mean, Rendering Ranger 2, I would say it's not 
you know, because it wasn't released after the N64, but it's still relatively late in the life cycle. Um, like Thrakia 776 is, a, is an example where it was released in like, what, 2000? The regular cartridge version was. So yeah, that's why it's expensive. It's not Ranger Ranger R2 expensive, but it's quite expensive. Uh, let's see. Desreal saying that... Uh, so the situation with Rendering Ranger R2, it was a European game released in uh, released in Japan only, was similar to Tadomaru and Time Warner only being released in Japan. I've not heard of those, so I'm not. I don't know uh, the behind the scenes of those. And then Danny saying N64 is one console that he was never interested in the past, and even now, yeah, it's like if someone, if I was, if there was like a, I don't know. Like there was a young person who wanted to get into retro games. On the fir the first system I was I would recommend them is probably the the Super Famicom. I would I would recommend the N sixty four only to play like, um, like Ocarina of Time, but then like Twilight Princess and uh, Breath of the Wild are you know I think better incarnations of that. Um, First-person shooters. I mean, of course, you got Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. Perfect Dark is an amazing game. I would recommend that to everybody. Uh, but yeah, it's really hard to recommend the N64 to like to collect a complete set. Whereas like completing a SNES complete set, you've got a lot of really good games in there. Whereas the N64, you've only got a few good games in there. Um, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, 80s Retro Gamer is saying clip my hair live on YouTube. Um, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe we could have a, a, a stream where, where I, pl I play a game and... Yeah, perhaps. Whoa, 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 whoa. I've really got to get a proper controller for this. There we go. That's the letter. So we've got N and one. W. P. Where where are you at? Q. Is it just me or do does everybody in the United Kingdom know the NATO phonetic alphabet? When I just remember I was on I think I was talking to somebody somewhere. It might have been on the phone. Um, oh, they, they open up. Well, when in America, like it's like you just like make you just make stuff up as you're going along. <laughs> it's just like D is in dog, C is in coffee, uh, H is in hot dog. Not like it's here where it's like. To, like <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's get a little bit more light in here. No, 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 I look like a weird two-face. Hold on, let's, uh, yep, there we go. Using the power of magic. Let's see, let's, ooh, this is actually really good against doors, I gotta say this. Whatever shot this is, the scythe shot, I don't even know what to call this. Because if you look at the, um, let's see, and then when you get in here, yeah, the spread shot's obviously going to be best for clearing up. Although the spread shot's also really good. The problem, the thing with the scythe shot is that it's just clearly inferior to the spread shot. It's just not as good. And then you've got the laser focus shot, which is really good against bosses, but doesn't seem to be good against anything else besides the super big enemies. Like the the bomb for the the laser shot just is that wins you the game. Let's see here, like I don't even know what these are supposed to be, like floating platforms that drop bombs. We 
got a bloat. So we've got this is like this is a crazy boss here. It's not even really a boss um, until you get to like it, it's like this weird sequence where you have to blow up a power core. You then fight the real boss. You have to blow up another power core that actually shoots stuff at you. Oh, no, this one shoots stuff at you too. So yeah, this is where the laser really comes in handy. And it'll come even more in handy when we've got to face the real boss. Which is coming up in just a moment. And then what this guy does is, yeah, he shoots out this, like, circle of beams of lasers at you. While also shooting laser beams at you, he's got the laser balls coming at you. Yeah, lost, lost a bomb there. The level overall isn't that difficult. The, the level scaling here is very, very strange. Because, like, this boss wasn't difficult. The, the rest of this level is not difficult. And then you get to level 7. Although I think this is level 5, right? Level 6 isn't too bad. You get to level 7, and then it's just like... All right, game's over because you're not you're not gonna be able to beat this. <laughs> gotta time myself. Gotta concentrate. Get past the laser beams. And then they also the other way they make this level super easy is not only is it really that difficult to kill all the enemies. They're just giving you, like, power-ups and uh, health regen all over the place. Oh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Didn't stand in the right place. And then I've also, my other, my lead hack uh, for getting through uh, Rendering Ranger R2 better is if you're about to die, make sure you have the shot you don't want to lose. Because every time you die... The shot you have equipped is reduced to its lowest level. So if you have the shot you don't want, it's like it doesn't matter. So that way, if you want to keep the spread, you know, have the shuriken equipped or have the laser beam equipped. Because I don't think the laser beam is actually that good, except for the bomb. Oh yeah, this is the boss. Okay, yeah, actually, I, I stand. I need to um, correct myself. The boss here can be a pain unless you know how to cheese it. And so I will show you if you need to know how to cheese uh, the level five boss of Ranger Ranger R two. Uh, I will show you how to do it. <laughs> here we go. Yeah, see, the boss is gonna come out of here. This is my time to drink some water. So this at at walker uh, mf'er is gonna walk out here, and if you fought it fairly, you're gonna you would have a hard time. But then you're gonna walk. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk over here. <laughs> Hold on, come on. Yep, there we go. So what you do is you walk over to the far right of the. You gotta make sure you have your shurikens equipped. <laughs> And you just do this for like 20 minutes. So now I'm gonna use this. Uh, I'm gonna use this opportunity to read the chat. <laughs> Let's see. 80s retro gamers saying I will never cheat in my games. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the the thing is, is for like the old games, like they are purpose built to bilk you out of quarters. Like they're just. They're just ports, especially like for the Famicom, not necessarily for the Super Famicom, but to a certain extent it is true, that these games are just built to like steal quarters from you. Like that's their whole reason for being. Actually, I might wait for the bombs to come back up uh, before 
I take the plunge because I, I suppose the real trick here is you have the spread gun equipped so that you can do maximum damage. Because I think you can get all three. Yeah, because it's got three streams. You can hit it with all three streams at the same time. Then you wait for your bombs to regenerate. Then you equip the laser gun and then you just laser him in the face. It's going down a little bit. It's going. It goes down like a pixel every like five seconds. But that's true of like all of the bosses. Basically, like after level four, the bosses have such a high amount of HP that the only way that I've been able to kill them is to use the laser bomb. Because you like look at this. Now we're gonna equip the laser bomb, and now we're just gonna like. That's, and this guy has even, I think, even more HP than, than the other bosses. This is the only boss that I think takes any significant amount of time. Yeah, yeah, 80s Retro Gamer, the, the arcade games really are fixed. Like, I think that's another stream idea I have is beside... Like, I've got a bunch of stream ideas, but one of them is to calculate... I think the first one I'll do is once I have my Saturn back, I want to calculate how many how much money I would have had to have spent in the arcade to actually clear a shooter. I might actually do that with all of the Neo Geo games uh, once I can figure out how to properly stream Neo Geo. I think that'd be fun is, I think, and then if you calculate it out as like, because in Japan, like in America, it, it was quarters. That's what you put into arcade systems. But in Japan, it was 100 yen coins. And so there's, there's like a legend, I don't know if it's true or not, that back in the 70s when Space Invaders first came out, that there was a national shortage of 100 yen coins because everyone was using them in the arcade. Not back in, at least, at least from what I've read back in the, um, the 70s, it was um, 100 yen coins. Um, maybe in the modern stuff. See, and then what absolutely blows my mind about level five in this is you'll, you'll blow up that at Atwalker. And then it's like, oh, no, game's not over yet. You've got to blow up this, uh, this power core. Okay, come on, got to time it right. Yeah, I want to make sure I have the laser bomb equipped because, especially with the upcoming, um, with the power core that's coming up, I want to have the laser bomb equipped because you can just ice it in like three seconds and then you can get at, then you just get the hell out of dodge. I always hit the wrong button. Yeah, see, like, look at that. You just, you keep, you get your three bombs equipped, and then you just blow it up in, like, two seconds. And then you've got to run the hell out of here. I think, like, I think no joke, it would probably cost me, like, if I was playing it in the arcade, it probably would have cost me, like, $50 to clear Metal Slug. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something I want to figure out for myself. And that would be really cool if I could um, get a consoleized MVS. That's really that's where that's really where the magic happens. Let's see, hold on. Let me pause. Hold on, let me pause and read some of the um, we got some new people in the stream. Our our dormer, welcome to the stream. Kung Fu, welcome to the stream. Uh, our dormer is saying this is uh, two and a half thousand dollars yes indeed uh render ranger r2 is for a, for a mint copy actually this you could probably find this i looked this up the other day a decent copy was on ebay for two grand uh us and then on mandarake i think a mint copy is going for like three thousand dollars and then yeah um kung fu this is like it's i think probably one of the better games for the system like if i was gonna rate it 
Would it be top 10? Like, that's crazy. Like, the thing about this NES is when people try to come out with, like, top 10 lists, it's, like, it's so hard because you've got, like, the, the net, you've got the SNES games that everyone knows, but then you've got the, the, the treasures that people don't really know about that I think really could stand up pound for pound. Like, Star Fox is a good game. I mean, it was good, good for the time. I would obviously, it's not really good now because, because of the slowdown, but, like, Ranger Major R2 is, like, sublime. <laughs> it's Retro Gamer saying it would cost you your mom money. Um, I guess if you're like, if you inherited like a million dollars. That's that the only circumstance I would ever um, conceive of paying two and a half thousand dollars for a game is if I was, a, if, I, if I had an income of a million dollars. Not even if I had a million dollars, but if I had a steady income of a million dollars, that's when I would start collecting games like this. It's actually a sort of a resolution I have made for myself is um, even if I do get a regular job or some kind of income, I'm trying, I think, I really don't want to buy any games for myself until like 2020. Well, no, I mean, if, I would not say no if someone was going to like give me a gift of a game. Um, but I do not want to purchase any games for the next year and a half. <laughs> I mean, for like Christmas, I'll, I'll get you something. <laughs> I get you Ben and Jerry's. Although we'll see, because um, the... Uh, was it Waitrose has the vegan stuff pretty regularly, but the um, the Morrisons, it will have it occasionally. I think, and the problem is with the vegan stuff is because it's more expensive. I'm not sure if it's part of that deal where it's like you know normally it's like five pounds, but then it's um, yeah. Well, I can I Waitrose definitely has it. And I think it's cheap at Waitrose. I think it's um no, I think it was um I think they were having a deal on it last time. Because remember, that's when we got, um... We bought the pints for, like, three pounds, three pounds fifty. Are you sure? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Let's see, um, Ardenar saying, or no, sorry, Danny saying Metal Slug AES in Japan is more than Ranger Ranger R2. He's like, yeah, I think if, if I was a literal millionaire, that's when I would start collecting Neo Geo. <laughs> like, that's the only way you could collect Neo Geo these days. MVS isn't so bad, um, but my issue with the MVS is um, a bunch of the games are on EPROMs. So those are just time bombs just waiting to, um, to fail. So if you're not familiar with EEPROM, so most cartridge games, virtually all cartridge games for mo for all systems, are mask ROMs, which means that the the data is actually etched into the um, into the circuit or into the the ROM uh, memory chip, into the chip, I should say. What EEPROMs are is they're commonly found in like development kits because they're um, reprogrammable, they're flashable, or they're they're much more easily flashable than um, or no, because what do you mean, flash kernels? Uh, maybe I'm not, I that's out of my that's out of my knowledge field. See, here's another thing. It's like, I, I can't tell where I'm supposed to go or how close I'm supposed to get to this thing without getting hit because of the, the way the hitbox is rendered. Yeah, because um, Metal Slug AES, as last I checked, was like $10,000 and Rendering Ranger is only $2,500. Hold on, I gotta, I gotta get another picture of the password. Oh, there can't be that many. I'm probably 10. 10's pretty standard. I'm actually not sure, though. Two levels. 
Um, let's see. Oh, someone's got, uh, let's see, there are nine levels. So I actually got pretty far um, when I was playing. I got to level seven. Well, because it's just, it, at a certain point, it just gets too difficult. Like, when we get to when we get to level 7, I will show you how freaking difficult this game can get. It's not, level 6 isn't so bad. I can clear that, no problem. It's just level 7 is just like, you've just got, like, thousands of enemies coming at you, and it's really hard to keep track. Uh, let's see. Uh, Puzzle Bobble. Yeah, Danny, you're, that's like Puzzle Bobbles and EEPROM. I think there's a couple of others. It's not many. MVS games that are EEPROMs. And, and the other thing is, like, when you're talking about, like, a SNES EEPROM, okay, you've only got, like, what, a couple chips that you gotta worry about? For the, um, for the Neo Geo EEPROMs, you've got, like, 10 ROM chips that you have to worry about. You've gotta flash them properly, and you've gotta be able to put them back into the cartridge properly. And so, yeah, I mean, maybe it lasts 20 years, but I don't wanna have to keep reflashing it every 20 years just for Puzzle Wobble. Or is, the, or is a mask ROM, like, you know, that'll last for, you know, well beyond the time that we're on this mortal coil. What? That's another, that's the big thing that I'm worried about. Well, not worried about so much, uh, but is a concern with the, um, with Game Boy Advance cartridges forward. So, like, Game Boy Advance, Vita, and even Switch. Although, no, Switch, I think, are mask ROMs because you can't save, you don't save to the Switch cartridge, you save to the the console itself. Whereas with Game Boy Advance, is that true with Vita as well? With Vita, do you save to the cartridge or to the um, to the console? So they're probably mask ROMs. Whereas like Game Boy Advance, they're actually flash memory. So after you save so many times, you can't save anymore because you end up like burning through the, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the technical um, details of it, but there gets a point where you have so many write cycles to one of those ROMs, to the point where you just use up all the the read the um, the write cycles where you can't save anymore. And so that's a, a bit of a concern with um, Game Boy Advance and uh, DS cartridges. And that's, I think, what's going to happen to a lot of Pokemon games, especially, is that they don't need batteries to operate, but you're just going to you're going to burn out the cartridge at a certain point. But then again, there were so many of those games made that, like, okay, just find another one. Like there, are, there, there will be a point where no one's going to want Gen Three anymore. So, you know, you can buy them for like um... <laughs> at a certain point, and then probably there will be repros or proper um, ROMs that you can buy from Nintendo. Let's see, let me get the password in. IP. Gen 3 is really where I fall off. Like, I played Omega Ruby. I have um, Emerald that I want to play, but it's just the... I'm, I'm a Gen 1 and 2 snob. Like, look, I'm a millennial. That's, that's where I'm at. Uh, reading the chat a bit. Um... Danny's asking, Jay, what is your opinion on reproductions that look like the original? For example, PC Engine works as reproductions of PC Engine games, PC Engine games, of copies of expensive games. I, well, for one, there are, I guess, the officially licensed reproductions, like um, Iron Commando, uh, Majuo for the Super Famicom. Where they get the, where a company will get the rights to a game, and then they'll make reproduction cartridges, and those are very obviously different. Like they'll be different colors, the art will be a little bit different. It'll have that publishing company's um, logo on it, so it's it's a distinct copy. It's, it's a distinct printing of it, which is like fine. Like I don't obviously don't have any problem with that because it's it's a legally made game. It's when you get into people making making copies of games that they don't own the rights to and when they are functionally identical that's a big problem that i have with say like sapphire like there are copies of sapphire out there that are really hard to tell the difference between the copy and the actual game itself i gotta find k there we go 
And I think it's just so easy for those games to be passed off as legitimate to where you're, you could spend $800 on a copy of Sapphire and you're not sure if, if what you're buying, if that buyer is getting a legitimate copy or not. Whereas for me, like I, I don't really see myself ever really buying a, a legitimate reproduction copy because I see these as antiques and I want the original game to where if I'm going to be buying a reproduction copy, I'm probably just gonna be emulating it or playing it on a flash cartridge. Yes, yeah. I, I just I like the I, I like the idea of having a connection to the original like the originally produced product. I see it as a like a time capsule or representative of the time that it was created. To where if you're doing reproductions of that, I feel like you lose that connection. But that's like, look, if you, if you want to buy reproductions, like, go ahead. Like, it's not my money. <laughs> and that's true. If it's, if, it's on a, if it's on a material level, like, functionally identical. Now, see, but to me, that's even worse. Like, I would much rather have a... A game that is different and a with bo the box and the material being the original because that's what's gonna happen to like all CD games the CD games are just gonna melt so it's like at a certain point you're just not going to be able to have original CD games because they're just not gonna work yeah I think that well this sixth level I think is looking more difficult than it actually is because it's hard to concentrate while doing the commentating at the same time. Maybe if, you know, maybe if I stream more, I'll actually get over that. That might be a goal. I think I'm... We'll see how the schedule works, but I'd like to maybe stream every other day, if that's possible. Because in that way, I could, like, practice the game a little bit, and especially if I want to have my ambition of... I definitely want to stream every game that I own. But then I would also like to be able to... It's probably the lower... It's not 2,000. I don't think I have 2,000 games. I definitely have 1,000 games. I think the first thing I do when I go back home, once my visa runs out, is I'm going to... I've got to catalog all of my games. I have a big list, but... I want to say about two years ago, I got really lax in keeping the list up. So I'm not actually sure how many games I have, but it's definitely over a thousand, but it's definitely below 2,000. I did buy a lot of cartridges though. Like I remember when I thought I was going to leave Japan the first time, um, after I was done being an English teacher, I bought a lot of uh, Famicom cartridges. <laughs> played um i've played a bunch of them how many have i completed oh not you know a few like not that many but then but that um well because there's there's the games for the series that i care about so i definitely want to complete um all of the fire emblem games i definitely want to complete all of my castlevania games um but if a game like but if I have a game, like, there's, a, like, a Star Wars game that I have. Like, Super Star Wars. Super Star Wars is way too hard. Like, like I definitely want to put some time into it. But there's no way that I'm going to be able to put in or, or have the willpower to put in the 50 hours. The only games that I'm going to be putting 50 hours into are going to have a story behind it. Because, for one, I want to enjoy the story. And, for two, if it's in Japanese, then I can, you know improve my Japanese ability. See, here is my issue, again, with Rendering Ranger, is it's like, where does the hitbox begin? Where... 
How am I supposed to get through this? Okay, actually, I might do magic on this, so I won't have to go through that nightmare again. This boss is not terribly difficult. It's just a marathon. Because for one, you actually can't do a lot of damage to the boss until you've got to blow up some of its constituent parts before you can actually start damaging the core. You see here, you've got this head that starts shooting like uh, spiky laser balls at you. Oh, shoot. Because you've got to blow up that's phase one. You've got to blow up the, the thing that the antenna that shoot spiky laser balls at you. Then you've got to blow up the eyes that start shooting fireballs at you. Yeah. Like, I don't think I finished 220 games in the last, like... Uh, no, I think I've finished probably that many games, like, in my life. <laughs> and then, see, now we're at the actual part of the boss where you can actually start doing damage to it. The trick is, you just have to manage to stay alive long enough to use your bombs, and then, like, he's got the core actually will go off screen. You can see here, this is when you can actually start doing damage to it. <laughs> yes, look at me playing Rendering Ranger R2, a 1995 game for the Super Famicom. Fake gamer. No, what, what makes me a fake gamer? I've played, like, I mean, with this, I've played, like, three hours of games today. Um, well, I think if I can do this, if I've got the streaming idea that I want, if I can actually implement that and actually see some success, I would end up playing games every day, I would think. And because not only will I be doing the, the prep, I'll be doing the streams, the prep for the streams, but also the games, because I've got a review series that I want to do. And then, yeah, this is the, this is the real problem: is that you've got to wait for the the core to actually come back into the frame of the game to actually start hitting it. That's the real. That's the. It's a marathon. Not. It's not an actual challenge with the boss. It's like look at that, like iced, like done. <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah, I would say you you can, because you can concentrate on a single thing for longer than I can. So this, this is where the, um, the rubber hits the pavement for me in Render Ranger R2, because this level is just so freaking difficult, to the point where we'll see how far I can get, but we might just, um, for some of the people that came in, we might just restart the game, um, and start back from level one, just because I cannot clear this level. Um, it's not as fun to save state spam, and I can't read chat, do the save, do um, save state, save save state spam. It's called save scumming. Save scumming? Is it no saves? I thought save save scumming is when you just kept redoing the save so that you could get a better RNG. I thought that's what save scumming, save scumming was. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, let me get the, I'll read chat after I get a picture of the password. Okay, let's, let's look at the chat for a second. I need, to, I need to get better light in here. Actually, let me turn on the light. There we go. 
that will show my face a lot. Okay, yeah, that's a lot better. We can close that now. Okay, let's see. Danny's saying, I heard PC Engine Works selling boots of Sapphire passing off as original and stealing fan translations. Yeah, so that's like, the, th the thing with repro games is that only a very few repro games are being reproduced with the holding the actual rights to the games. Like 99% of, like 99.9% .9 of repro games are just like, they're, they're like, it's illegal. It's, it's copyright infringement. Whereas, you know, it's not like a ROM where like, you know, it's like whatever, you know, there's no money changing hands. But when you're talking about an actual physical product, it's for one, it's not the same as having the actual antique. And for two, it's, yeah, it's being done through fraudulent means. And it's so very easy that even if you're reproducing the game exactly the same, it's just going to get passed off and as the actual game itself. And that's not, that's not fair. Yeah, 80s retro gamer saying he has a flash cart for his Mega Drive. Yeah, you know, flash carts are one thing. Like, that's, I, I have absolutely zero problem with, with flash carts. Because, like, especially for a game like Rendering Ranger R2, it's like, who knows who actually owns the rights to this game? And for two, if you want to play it on the original hardware, there's no way you're going to be able to give, like, Manfred Trends, like, you know, 50 bucks. To, to have another copy of this game. You're going to be paying Mandarake $3,000. Like, and like, does Mandarake deserve $3,000 for you to play Ranger Ranger R2? No, I don't think so. Uh, Ball Dell is saying, this is what, Ranger Ranger R2 is what R-Type should have been. I mean, R-Type, like, that came out, like, what, late 80s? Like, you know, this game came out, like, seven years later. Although I believe, I believe Rainbow Arts came out with an R-Type port, probably for the Commodore 64. It wouldn't surprise me. Like, I freaking love the Commodore 64. Uh, for the SNES, yeah, I mean, what, I mean, you've got Axley that's sort of like a, another hybrid shooter. Um, there's another couple of shooters that I haven't played quite yet. I know, um, Gradius 3 was kind of disappointing. Uh for this uh upside diy hey welcome to the stream uh he's saying i used to they, they I, you know, I should not assume the gender uh i used to always play this game on the nes it's called galactica yeah i mean um or like galica or Ga galactica yeah galica galica is a pretty big shooter um i mean yeah galica is probably like i remember playing it and i was like i think it come out what like 84 on the Famicom, and you're like, holy crap, like this is, it was absolutely, when you compare it to the other games that had come out up to that point, it was absolutely revolutionary. Yeah, and um, 80s re um, Retro Gamer is saying, um, our type was epic for its time. Yeah, I mean, I've got, I actually ended up buying our type part two. Uh, for the PC engine. I haven't played it yet, but I've played R-Type 1, and it's like, yeah, it's it's phenomenal. And you definitely see its influence when you look at, like, Polestar. Was it Polestar, or was it Burning Laser, or both of them, uh, for the Neo Geo? Let's see, that's, no, I want the passwords to enter. And there's a lot of other R-Types, too. Like, there's R-Type Delta, R-Type Final... Um, for the PlayStation that I haven't gotten around to yet. L N V P M V. Give me V. Where's the V? V P P P P P. And where is M? Hold on, got a, the password went away on my phone. Q, Q, us, 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 us. I really should have learned that song for karaoke. Um, you know the Yatta song? Yatta, Yatta. Oh, I hope, I hope uh, YouTube doesn't uh, demonetize the stream for my... Uh, crystal clear rendition of yatta 
I forgot a lot of the words. That was back in the day, if anyone remembers. Any mutations. NEP, hey Jay Contra, just wanted to say your videos were invaluable for me to my trip to Japan last year. Well, that I'm glad they helped you out. That's the whole point of uh, why I'm doing half of it, is to um, better inform people on, on where to find games. And I know it's not... I've got a, I, I like started filming this series about like the different shops that I don't think are very useful now, um, but I will put up once people are actually allowed back into Japan. Uh, I've already got like 20 videos <laughs> recorded. Well, maybe not 20, but like 10. Uh, let's see. You can't beat the first R type. I yeah, I don't think I beat the first R type. It's very difficult uh, after a certain point. And then Danny is saying, Blazing Star was a sequel to Polestar. Yeah, you know, it's hard for me to keep track of all those Neo Geo games, especially when there's no way I'll ever be able to afford them. What is absolutely baffling to me is, is why... Like, Metal Slugs are really good. I just don't understand why Metal Slug 1 is $10,000. Like, I'm guessing it's because everyone wants Metal Slug... You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to see if I can get past um, this section just by using the bombs. Because there's no, other, like, there's no other way I can get past all these guys. Because you're just moving so fast. And what it seems to me is with this particular shooting section, it's not about destroying the enemies. It's just about surviving. Because with all of the movement, all you have to do is survive. You're going to get to the end of the level. Yeah, yeah, 80s Retro Gamer. I There's been a bunch of games that I've played recently that are games that I played when I was a kid. Um, like, take, like, Heart Gold, for instance. Like, I think it's, it's one, on one level, it's just the time you had to put into games. Because when I was in college, that's when I got Soul Silver. I want to say I put, like, 80 hours into that game. But then when you, when I played Heart Gold recently... I put 20 hours into it, and I was like, eh, that's fine. The thing is, is with, like, Famicom games, you just, you're not able to track how much time you put into a game. So, like, if you actually tracked it, if you had, like, say, Contra. If Contra actually had a feature where you could track the time, if you looked at how much time you sunk into Contra when you were a kid, it would have been, like, you know, like... 80 hours because that was only you know you had like two games when you were a kid but now when you can have so many games and you have so little time it's just like eh, yeah maybe you're not going to want to be actually beat contra because it's just going to take so much time in order to get good at it because i do feel like i'm i'm better at games like maybe my reaction time isn't as good because i'm older but i definitely have a lot more skills at games now than i did when i was a kid See, in level 7 is, is a complete mess. you just got so much stuff coming at you. I, th I think there are action replay codes. Um, but for one, I'm not entirely sure how to... Uh, I know there's a, there's a menu here where I think I can input codes, but I don't think there, there are no native codes. There are passwords, but there aren't any native codes. I think I need to check. I think I have a tab open on this. Might be what we might skip to level eight. I'm not sure. But if I think that the difficulty curve is really steep. And so it might honestly just not be worth uh, going to level eight on this. Because it's just going to be so hard. Like, look at how useless those missiles are. Because looking at the different strengths... Like, the laser strength is just, like, superb. And the shuriken bomb is great. Yeah, I... Well, all right, we'll do it one more time, but... I, um... Oh, did I screw up the... Oh, oh no! I screwed up the same... <laughs> okay, no, we're, we're going back to level one, because I'm not, I'm not doing that noise again. <laughs> just read, um read chat real quick. NAP is saying the most expensive ga game I saw in Japan besides Maximum Carnage was Breakers 
for like $4,500. Is Breakers... Are you talking about like Brickinger or is Breakers the... Uh, Yeah, Maximum Carnage is really expensive because it is just a really, it is a supremely low print game for the Mega Drive, which did not do well in Japan. So a lot of Mega Drive games in Japan are more expensive than games in Europe and America because the print runs were so much let, lower because the sales were just significantly lower. Um, and so that's why, and Maximum Carnage is one of those like sweet spot games where it was a foreign title that like barely got a um, licensing deal in Japan. So basically people are only buying it to complete the set. Not because it's like that good of a game. As opposed to like, what are other expensive games? Like you've got, um, oh, what's the game? Um, it's like Infinite Down or I, it's, um, Zero Down, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a shooter that's like $1,500. And that's like a legit, like rare shooter for the Mega Drive that's really expensive, but it's not maximum carnage expensive. And the, like the Mega Drive is a, is a system because George loves the Mega Drive. The only problem is that all the games are really expensive for it. Like, um, Streets of Rage 3 is like, it's like $150 now. And I thought Mega Drive collecting would have plateaued. And I think it has, by and large, the prices aren't going up as fast as they used to. But they're still going up, which is really surprising to me. So I thought people would have maybe, they would have gotten into the Mega Drive and they're like, okay, let's move on. Maybe it's just the games got sucked out of Japan and people just aren't putting them back into the system. Like, they're, they're buying them and they're holding on to them. As opposed to the Super Nintendo where you have that nostalgia burst where you're like, oh, I want to get, like, Zelda and a couple of other games. And they're like, hey, I'm, I'm done with this. I don't need this anymore. And then they just get put back out onto the market. Whereas Mega Drive collectors and PC Engine collectors especially are that hardcore where they just hold on to the games and so the prices stay flat or even go up in some cases. Oh, I gotta blow up that uh, that laser emitter before I jump over. That's the real trip uh, trick with some of these. You gotta be sure that you're able to actually extend the game frame over to the enemy so that you can hit, get the hitbox and hit it properly. Especially the, the the early levels on this, if you can maintain your spread gun, or if you can maintain any of your shots, really, they're, like, no problem. It's just that when you're taking damage, it's when you're first starting out. And that's true of Contra as well. That's true of basically most, like, run-and-gun shooters. Is as long as you can keep your upgrades, the games are actually quite easy. <laughs> like, if you can keep the spread gun in Contra, it's, like, not that difficult of a game. It's just keeping that spread gun that that's the real challenge. And that's where I feel like the difficulty of rendering Ranger R2 doesn't really kick in until the last few levels. To where it just gets to such a high level that it's just like almost impossible. Oh, Breakers! Yeah, that's right. That's, um... Oh, is Breakers... It's not a, um... Is there's a couple of weird like fighting games like Matra Melee is really is a really expensive fighting game like the the cheap um, Neo Geo games tend to be fighting games because they were printed in such high qualities high quantities but then you look at games like um, yeah especially like Matra Melee is the big one that I can think of where it's like 800 bucks um, although even King of like there's King of Fighters 2001 and Samurai Spirits uh, Ray, that's like two grand. That's the one I see pretty often. Is it Samurai? Yeah, it's like Samurai Spirits or Samurai Showdown.
Like, especially with the laser, like, the first boss is, like, no problem. Like, you just blow, you blow up the, um, the guns quickly. Although not as, I could have done it quicker. More quickly, quicker. And then you just stand in the middle until it stops its flamethrower, and then you use your laser to obliterate it. NAP is saying one CC Contra after a week. Well, you're better than me. It took me a while. I think I, I never actually even beat Contra correctly. I beat it. I had to cheat to beat Contra. Let's see. The flash cart. Yeah, what flash cart did you get, 80s Retro Gamer? Because um, the flash carts that I've been looking at have been the Cricks. Uh, flash carts because they seem to be the ones that do quite well and often actually the ones from China I think actually tend to copy that design unfortunately but then but then they're also cheaper so if you know if you want the cheaper one yeah you got to buy the ones that come from China because I think what isn't it Craig's isn't he like in U Ukraine or something <laughs> I don't know where he's making it though Danny's saying I bought he bought Streets of Rage 3 for the Mega Drive five years ago for 90 bucks. Yeah, I mean, now it's like 120. You can, if you can get a deal on it, it's like 110. Yeah, NEP saying, NEP saying um, they were surprised how expensive Hardcore and Bloodlines were, uh, like 700 bucks. Yeah, Hardcore, Contra Hardcore is like $300. There was one, as I was leaving Japan, there was a copy of Castlevania Bloodlines for 400 bucks. And I was so close to buying it, but I thought my 400 bucks would have gone a lot longer way if I'd bought some Super Famicom games. It's I don't exactly regret not buying it because I haven't I've never spent that much money on a video game. If it was, it probably would have been a Castlevania game. Um, but yeah, it's just because it got printed in such in much lower quantities in Japan than Bloodlines did. Uh, In, in, in the U.S. had a, a much higher print quantity uh, than Japan. Yes. Yeah, so wait. Oh, Samurai Spirits 5 special. Oh, so I was... Yeah, I can't remember what Samurai Spirits it was supposed to be. I just remember it was Samurai Spirits Ray. I didn't know if they'd given a proper number or not. Because was it, like, not released properly or something? Like, I've seen it. I've seen a bunch of copies of it. Like, at least... Like, I remember the uh, Mantaraki in Fukuoka had, like, two copies of it. But I don't... I think it was... Like, wasn't even, like, the... Was it the last uh, Neo Geo game officially released? You can jump on top... You can jump on things? No one told me that. Yeah, the, the things that move is really tough to gauge when the laser is actually going to reactivate. Yeah, if you can get retros, uh, ret 80s retro gamers saying they bought a flash cart for, like, f like 20, like, that's like 28 pounds, that's like, what, 40 bucks? Not even. That's like 35 bucks. Yeah, for a flash cart, that's insane. That's really good. Because the flash carts that I'm, like, there's an N64 flash cart that's got, like, 100% compatibility, and it's like $200, and I'm like, man... I, although I think the basic N64 flash cart's like 70 bucks. It's not that expensive. And the only game that it can't do is like Animal Crossing, which I have. Like it's a $20 game. And like the only reason it's so expensive is because it needs like some special chip in order for it to do like time calculations. <laughs> 
But that's, and you know, the thing is, is with, when you're trying to like emulate a lot of these games, like not, not what I'm doing now, playing it, um, it's just the, like the emulators, because especially for the Super Nintendo, there's lots of different chips that um, emulators haven't figured out, but also the, um, the flash cards haven't figured it out either. I, I know it's getting better. I know it was it was bad like a couple years ago. Like it was like the SA one. I think it's like just been figured out or something. But I think like even the Super FX chip like hadn't been figured out. Whereas like with emulation, they had figured out the chips like a long time ago. Like that's what got me back into retro gaming was um, emulating like Mario RPG and like Zelda, uh, Majora's Mask. And emulation is a lot better now than it was like 15 years ago when I was emulating this stuff in high school. Yeah, so that's, you know, I'd always wondered what Samurai Spirits that was. Thanks for the info, uh, Danny. Because I, like, I can, I can picture the, the the box and the label but i it's just because i think i think in japan the samurai um spirits aren't labeled by number i want to say they're labeled by they have their own special names and so it's hard for me to keep track of all that especially because i could never figure out how to play uh samurai spirits properly i was never good at it Whereas with, um, like, Street Fighter, I got okay at Street Fighter. I can play Street Fighter fine. Like, I can do, I can do Chun-Li all right. Um, because I, I can do her special moves all right. But I can't, um, I can't do the moves in Samurai Spirits well. Although 80s, yet, yeah, what's the compatibility like with, uh with flash carts for the Mega Drive because as far as I know what what dis, what made the N60 the the Super Nintendo distinct was that the games had like a bunch of games had special chips not necessarily for that specific game but they were like that there was the SA1 on the Super FX chip they made games better by doing the chips whereas for the Mega Drive they didn't have special chips for the Mega Drive as far as I remember like ha are like are there any special chips for the Mega Drive? I don't think so, but then you could maybe correct me if I'm wrong there. <laughs> What's wrong with Street Fighter? <laughs> I I freaking love Street Fighter. Like, if I was going to go pro at a... Not that I want to, but if I was going to do a, a, um, a series, it would be Street Fighter. Although I think you know, I, I remember there was just one day I did I had this crazy. I remember I was like, this is back when I was in Japan. I think this is still when I was single. I had just bought an arcade stick, and I was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna be I'm gonna get good at Street Fighter. So I ended up um, getting. I think I was playing. I can't remember what version it was. I think I got Street Fighter Alpha Three, and I was just like. I'm gonna play Chun Li, or no? I bought Street Fighter. That's what I did. I bought Street Fighter Five uh, for the PC. I had a USB arcade stick, and I was just like, I'm gonna buckle down, and I'm gonna learn how to do um, Chun Li's. Oh, what did she do? I, I learned how to do Spinning Bird Kick. I learned how to do the Kikolken, and then uh, then after like a. A, like a couple days I was like nah I don't want to do this anymore but maybe you know if I could get in if I could get into the street if I can get into the uh the, the fighting game community the FGC I think doing it by yourself is like very unproductive unless you're doing practice I think to actually keep yourself motivated you need people around you who are actually going to play the game with you 
And unfortunately, where I was, you know, I was just in the middle of nowhere in Japan, so there wasn't a lot of people who wanted to play Street Fighter. There were plenty of people who wanted to play Super Smash Brothers. I had a, a bu friends would come over to my house and we'd play Super Smash Brothers, but I don't think I was going to ever convince anybody uh, to play Street Fighter Alpha 3. <laughs> don't know what to call this shot i wish god i wish someone would upload the manual like i think that's something i really want to do is i don't think anybody's ever uploaded the manual for um for what was it um summer carnival 92 Reca, because it's just so freaking expensive and i feel like i need to double check but i don't know if anyone's ever uploaded the manuals a few might have i know he's done a lot of archiving archival stuff uh, but I'd really love to know what they named all of these different shots. Let's see, NEP did the sports games with announcers have to use special chips like World Series Baseball? As far as I know, I know the NES had special audio chips. Like I know um, the Japanese version of uh, Castlevania 3 has a special chip in it. I think um, that is why the sound is so much better for Castlevania 3 um, in the Japanese version. Um, I don't believe that was true for the SNES, but someone could maybe correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Uh, I think I'm going to start wrapping it up here just because it's been two hours. My brain's fried. Uh, my blood sugar's running low. Um, and it's starting to get time for bed here. Um, I'm not going to make any promises but I'm going to attempt to do a stream at the same time on uh, on Wednesday this week. So that'll be again, it'll be, it's seven o'clock my time in the UK. Um, that'll be uh, one o'clock Eastern Standard Time, which is 10 or 11 West Coast time. And while everyone is still in the chat, please do not leave yet because I have um, you might have seen it already, but I'm trying to get people to fill out. This is going to be the last day. I'm probably going to film the Q&A tomorrow. Um, but this is the last day that I'm going to have my um, survey open where I want to get your opinions on um, what kind of videos you want to see, what kind of streams you want to see on the channel. Um, and if you have any questions for the q and I recently hit 6,000 subscribers and I just wanted to see what people actually wanted on the channel. Um, so if you could fill in the survey, I'd be very grateful for that. Um, I'm going to do uh, q and A will go up next week. I'm going to film that tomorrow. Um, I will do a results show probably the week after. Uh, and then I've got a lot of, uh, I got some plans that I want to start. I want to start kicking out some new videos. Uh, over the next couple weeks, new kind, new types of videos. Um, that's actually why I'm doing this stream now. Is I want to do a video where I go into like the history of Ranger and Ranger R2, um, why why it's so expensive, and I want to do that for a lot of very expensive SNES games. On Wednesday, I'm going to stream another Super Famicom game. I won't say what because I'm not quite sure yet. Um, but I, I had a lot of lot of fun doing this. We got some people in the. Um, a lot of people in the chat, which is very good. It's very good to see. Um, I'm going to call it here because I'm starting. My, my brain's starting to wander. Thank you for everyone uh, for being in the chat. Thank you for your comments. Again, please fill out the survey. Um, it's just a few questions, and then there's a little space if you want to give me a specific su suggestion. And I will be doing a Q&A tomorrow. Um, so if you want to have your question answered, uh, put it into uh, the form there. Otherwise, be streaming again on Wednesday with another Super Famicom game. I have been your man out of Japan, Jay Contra. Thanks for watching. See you next time. And mahalo.